My name's Ann Tunerman. I'm the founder of Tales the Cocktail. I want to welcome you to uh, Tales on Tour. This is our seventh Tales on Tour. And uh, I'm proud to say that I think Claire Warner has been with us for most of those. Um, she is the Director of Spirits Education for Moed Hennessy. And uh, we were just talking, I will brag about her a little because she's a very dear friend of Tales of the Cocktail. Um, but she has been a recipient of uh, one of our world's best brand ambassador awards at the Tales of the Cocktail Spirit Awards, which I have to say I think is a very competitive category, so congratulations to Claire. Um, she also has been one of our Dame Hall of Fame honorees, and um, there's something special about a dame. I mean, when you think about that word, it's kind of like, you know, a woman that's like, you know, saucy, spicy, willing to take risk, but also ladylike uh, at the same time. And, you know, she just does an amazing job. So I want to tell you a couple things about Tales the Cocktail, too, related to Claire and her awesome panel. But the two things that we really pride ourselves on that make us different than we think from anybody else, and it's been this way for the 15 years that we've been doing this event, is that one, we're always focused on education. So yes, we want you to have a good time and you enjoy the, you know, the bars, the food, the drink here, just like in New Orleans. You know, we like to think that no matter what you're doing, you're learning something. This is our biggest Tales on Tour to date as far as seminars and content that we're providing. In New Orleans this summer, we'll have 84 seminars. And people like Claire submit their ideas that are reviewed by a committee of their peers to get selected for that seminar. Um, and then these gentlemen will tell you, I mean, they prepare, they have rehearsals, so it's like they really put a lot of time and effort into the content that they're bringing you. I mean, we ask a lot of our presenters, and I'm very grateful that they deliver. Uh, and the second thing is that, you know, when you support, you know, one of these brands or you support us or you come to our event, it's like we're taking your money and investing it back into the bartending community. So we have a scholarship fund. We have a tuition reimbursement fund. So if you want to take a class that's like, you know, QuickBooks or public speaking, something, you know, not even related to bartending, but that will make you a better business person, you know, that's an option. Uh, we also have a medical aid fund. Um, that I've been saying sadly we've been having to use too often, but you know when people get hurt in our industry uh, You know they're not getting a paycheck like some of us no matter what so again We'll either work with them on their doctor bills or a lot of times recently What we do is pay somebody's rent for a month or two because then I think that's most people's biggest expense But they also don't have to be rushed back to work You know we don't want you to you know break an arm or a leg and then feel pressured to go back to work too soon because you're only going to injure yourself, you know, further. And again, what Claire is going to talk about too a lot is, you know, balance. If you're going to be in this industry for a long time, you know, it is physically and mentally, you know, draining and you have to take care of yourself just as much as you, you know, take care of the guest. So again, we're very appreciative that you're here. Again, she has an amazing panel of people uh, that are going to bring you this content. So uh, give Claire Warner a big round of applause. Thanks very much, Anne. It's lovely to see everyone here today to enjoy what I hope will be an informative uh, 90 minutes together as we explore guilty pleasures and ways to drink better. The holy grail of drinking, I think. Uh, but before we get into that, I just want to uh, say a big thank you to our panelists, starting with Zoe Cormier, who is a broadcaster, journalist, and author of Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. Did that just disappear? There you go. Uh, which is a book all about the science of hedonism and the hedonism of science. And she'll be talking a little bit about that book in her presentation today. Also want to thank Jeffrey Kluger, who is the senior science editor of Time magazine, also an author. I think you're up to like 20 plus books. OK, Nilly, Lily. <laughs> You, you need to work harder, Klugs. Um, but also author of Apollo 13. Not sure if you've heard of that book, book maybe, I don't know. A uh, pretty monumental book. And coming out soon, spring, summer? May 16th. May 16th is Apollo 8. So please all rush out and purchase a book. When is that available on Amazon, Klugs? Uh, it is available now, so you can pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> Take pre-orders now. We'll wait. Uh, also, Ian Griffiths, 
Have you written a book yet? No. What? Uh, no one wants <laughs> to. Working hard enough. <laughs> so Ian is the co-founder of the Lion brand and uh, all-round awesome guy, and also the co-founder of the anti-waste punk pop-up Trash Tiki. So thanks very much for joining us today. Yes, thanks to our sponsors. Thank you to Belvedere for putting us up and putting us here. But the big thanks goes to our caps for providing us with uh, liquid refreshment throughout the course of this next 90 minutes. So big round of applause to our caps. You guys rock. So let's get started. There is a silent spring of intoxicants that run through our bodies, through our lives, from the second that we wake up in the morning and we take a sip of tea or we take a sip of coffee, all the way through to how we relax, whether it be a cigarette or maybe something containing marijuana, or maybe we, we go to sleep with a pharma cuticle a tablet that you might have got from your neighborhood dealer or perhaps from Boots. Um, but essentially, we use drugs daily to change the way that we feel. And nobody wants this to be unhealthy, nobody wants this to be dangerous, certainly nobody wants uh, for people to live out their lives in crack dens or to die um, from cancer-induced tobacco diseases um, or to even be killed by drunk drivers. However, this leads us to the question, why do we pursue intoxication? <laughs> what drives us to seek out intoxication in the form of a well-made cocktail or a glass of beer or a wine? Certainly, cocktail culture and the proliferation of craft beers and wines have improved the contents of our glasses over the course of the last few years. But human beings have been seeking out intoxication for a millennia. So what is the universal appeal? Are we seeking pleasure? Are we seeking to escape? Are we seeking relief? The human desire to feel different from normal is very powerful and often controversial. So what we're going to do over the next 80 or 90 minutes is explore some of the reasons behind this human desire to drink. Zoe will explore how we've evolved with the ability to actually metabolize alcohol. Jeffrey, I was going to call him Klugs, but Jeffrey will explore how can we actually drink better if we're predisposed to metabolize alcohol? How can we do it better? I'm going to look at how, as an industry, we can help protect and preserve the lives of the customers that come into our bars. Essentially, can hospitality, in effect, save lives rather than lose lives? And Ian is going to talk about us. What about us? Acknowledging that hospitality should start at home and start with ourselves. So if we manage to get all of that in within the next 80 or 90 minutes, we will open up the floor to a Q&A. Now, naturally, we're going to be touching on topics which might be sensitive. So if anybody in the room feels that they need more advice or more support or more information, we recommend that you visit the Drink Aware website as, as a source of some great information uh, and uh, recommendations for where to go next. So, history has shown us that we've always used drugs. In every age, in every part of the planet, where there are human beings, we have pursued intoxication, whether it be drugs, alcohol, or other mind-altering substances. Consumption of these substances is clearly ancient, and no doubt their properties were discovered when someone put something in their mouth and things got a bit weird. So, what does this tell us about the power of intoxication? That it's this behavior has had so much force, so much natural persistence, that it really perhaps functions like a fourth drive after hunger, thirst, and sex. In his book, Intoxication, if anybody really wants to read an amazing book on intoxication, this is the one. According to Ronald K. Siegel, who is a psychopharmacologist, he argues that perhaps it is a part of our natural biology, creating this irrepressible demand for intoxicating substances. He's, he is quoted as saying, there is a natural force that motivates the pursuit of intoxication. This biological force has found expression throughout history and has led to the discovery of many intoxicants, natural and artificial, and to the demonstration of irrepressible drive. 
And we'll hear later from Zoe that we are not the only ones that seek intoxication. In fact, almost every species of the animal kingdom seek out some form of intoxication. Which leads us to consider whether or not the desire to be intoxicated is really primal. Is it innate? Perhaps rather than being innate, it's something that we learn to be motivated by. It's an acquired motivation. The major primary drives, those associated with, with survival, include the drives for hunger, thirst, and sex, because they serve a basic biological need. We're born with the need to eat, drink, and procreate in order to, to ensure the survival of our species. But while I'm sure that we've all uttered the immortal words, I'm dying for a drink, if we didn't drink alcohol, I guarantee we wouldn't actually die. I know you felt it that way, but I can guarantee you're unlikely to die if you don't consume alcohol. <laughs> So these acquired motivations are not unnatural, but they are perhaps simply an expression of who we are striving to be. The pursuit of intoxication is no more abnormal than the pursuit of love, of status, of social attachment, of thrills, or any other, or any other number of acquired motivations. Our primary biological needs are very much body-bound, but our acquired addictions soar way beyond these needs, and they perhaps even go as far to explain what it means to be human. So, Zoe, is to drink to be human? Um, so, <laughs> as Claire mentioned, this is my book, Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. Uh, so, I grew up in the music industry. Um, I have a biology background, but everyone in my family works in entertainment, and my father is a rock promoter. And I also worked at a venue as a bartender myself for five years when I was younger. So I know your industry very well. I'm very good at getting people hammered. Uh, so a lot of the inspiration for this book came from growing up surrounded by noise and by drugs. And so it is true what they say. A picture is worth a thousand words. This is me at six months old. Uh, so <laughs> this illustrates perhaps better than anything, the undeniable fact that getting high, getting hammered and chilling out is written into our blood and our genes. It is something we are programmed to do. I would also add that there is a partner photo to this that is my brother, my older brother, when he was six months old, but he's got Wayfarer sunglasses on. And I think what happened was my parents took off the sunglasses and saw his eyes and said, no, that's, that's the shot right there. So when I undertook the task of writing my book, I thought I was going to explore and explain why we do drugs and why we have sex in the way we do. But the more I researched it, I realized I was actually getting at a much more important question, which is what does it mean to be human? And this is the ultimate question that most philosophers and thinkers have been trying to get at since the very beginning. What is it that demarcates us from animals? What is it that separates us from the other living things on this planet? Is it the capacity for language? Is it mathematics? Is it the ability to think about the past, present, and future? Most of the time, scientists have focused on what are called our higher cognitive capacities, those things that we think are very cognitive. And so you can tell a lot about what we think about ourselves from our name. Homo sapiens, which is Latin for wise man, which means that we think that we're the thinky monkey, right? Here we've got Rodin's the thinker. We think it's the thinky part of ourselves that makes us special. And then we tend to denigrate getting high, having sex, uh, listening to loud music, we tend to denigrate these things as base pursuits. We tend to think of them as primitive or animalistic. But the more I looked at these three things, the more I realized, actually, yes, all other animals do rut, make noise, and take drugs, but we've taken all of them to the next level with a degree of sophistication and complexity that is completely unrivaled. And if we didn't do these things, we wouldn't be human. It is integral to the human condition. And there's no photo that sums that up better than this. This is Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock, right? This says it all. Number one, Jimi Hendrix, sex on legs. Number two, Drugs. Did you know that Jimmy would put little slits in his forehead and put tabs of acid there and then wrap a bandana around so he could just stay high the whole time? And lastly, music. Okay, there's 400,000 kids in that field. We think that we're so hardcore in the UK, 185 people at Glastonbury. 400,000 kids sat in a field in upstate New York in the mud for one stage, one stage. And they only planned for 30,000 people. And they didn't have boutique camping, they didn't have coffee, they were there for the power of music and drugs. So, are our base pursuits really so primitive? 
I think if we take a closer look, we'll find that our hedonistic pursuits really just need a rebrand. So let's get to drugs. I'll preface this with a little anecdote. I was on book tour in 2014 when my book came out, and I was at a little town in Scotland called Wigtown. They have a wonderful arts and music, uh, sorry, a book festival. And a lot of the audience was in their 70s and 80s, and I wasn't sure if they were really gonna dig the bit about drugs. So I said, okay guys, let me just do a temperature check, okay? Do you like any drugs? And this old man in a tweed suit with wireframe glasses sitting in the front row, he folded his arms and he glared at me and he looked at me and he said, acid. <laughs> so I was like, right, I'm getting, I am preaching to the converted, let's go. So, as Claire mentioned, humans are not the only animals that like to take drugs. So cats and catnip, obviously we've all seen them do this. It is endlessly fascinating and endlessly entertaining. Fly agaric mushrooms, uh, think of them as like the Supermaria mushroom. These hallucinogenic mushrooms are found all throughout the Arctic, and they contain, in fact, 40 different psychoactive chemicals. It's not just psilocybin in normal magic mushrooms. So these contain 40. And reindeer love them so much that reindeer have been known to divert their migratory paths in order to gorge on them when they come into season. And additionally, they've been known to do battle over the right to roll around in snow that people who have eaten the mushrooms have urinated onto. Pumas have been gnawing at the bark of the cinchona tree in uh, the Amazon for millions of years. And in fact, indigenous people in Peru who noticed this behavior mimicked it themselves, and then centuries later, this led to the development of quinine, a treatment for malaria. And you may have seen, I'm sure you all are familiar with marula and elephants. Did you know it's actually not the alcohol content in the marula fruit that's getting the elephants drunk. They're not sure what it is, but there's not enough alcohol in the fruit itself. It's something else. But as I said, we do it better than the rest. We have left them all behind. It is indeed the fourth drive. So as we've mentioned, every single culture on the face of the earth, from the top of the Arctic to the equator all around the world, every single culture uses some form of intoxicant to alter their consciousness. It is innate to being human. It is so ubiquitous, we have termed it to be more important, in fact, than a lot of other human needs. So why, though? And I don't just mean why do you want to get hammered. I mean, why do these chemicals in plants and fungi work? Okay, think about it. How could a chemical produced by the marijuana plant, how could a chemical produced by a mushroom, how could a chemical produced by a species that is millions of years older than our own species, how could something that comes from outside the human body work inside the human body. The more you think of it, the more of a puzzle it is. And this was a huge concern for scientists in the Victorian era. They wanted to understand how drugs work. So it turns out that drugs mimic neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are the natural chemicals inside your head and inside your bodies that create feelings. You can think of them as the messengers that, uh, that cells use to talk to each other. So you've heard the names of many of these before dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. So they're the mailmen in your mind, the chemical messengers that send signals and make you feel things like thrills and chills, shivers, all those lovely things. So what drugs do is they are shaped like those natural neurotransmitters and they go into the receptors, they go into the keyholes. So you can think of drugs as basically biochemical burglars. What they do is they slip into your brain nefariously. They lock pick your genome. Now, here's an example, psilocybin and serotonin. You can see we've got serotonin on the right. That's the chemical that we tend to associate with positive feelings. And then on the left, that's psilocybin. That's the chemical found in magic mushrooms. Most hallucinogens work by mimicking serotonin. So all drugs mimic some natural neurotransmitter in your body. So THC mimics something called the endocannabinoids. Opium mimics something called endorphins. Nicotine mimics acetylcholine. Cocaine mimics dopamine. LSD mimics serotonin. Ketamine, or you may be familiar with that, mimics glutamate, and barbiturates mimic GABA. So let's come to a drug that you may think of as actually kind of boring, alcohol. It's just a solvent, right? Like it's, it's basically, it's just a solvent. It's not a complex molecule. But alcohol, is actually very interesting because it doesn't just mimic one neurotransmitter, it mimics half a dozen neurotransmitters. It mimics dopamine, like cocaine does, serotonin, like psychedelics do, acetylcholine, like nicotine does, glutamate, like PCP and ketamine, GABA, like barbiturates. 
So you can think of it as the promiscuous drug. You can think of it as the slutty narcotic. It manages to fit into half a dozen different receptors in your brain. And as far as I know from my own research, and I've done a lot, there isn't any other drug that does this. So there's a reason why it is a lot of people's favorite drug. So there's a saying in science, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So in other words, did we evolve to drink, right? Is it just a happy accident or do we do it for a reason? So we do know that alcohol is one of our oldest drugs. Uh, so most archaeologists have tended to think, the standard thinking is that we have been making alcohol and consuming it for about 10,000 years. So about 10,000 years ago, we moved from being hunter-gatherers to settling down and farming. And it was when we started to farm that we could store grains and fruit and let it rot and collect the juice. So this is based on extensive archaeological examination of clay shards from places like Egypt and so forth. However, recent studies have turned this on its head. And to give you an idea of how recent this discovery is, it's just 2015. So geneticists now think that our capacity to drink could be way older than 10,000 years. They think it could be 10, wait for it, million years. 10 million years is how long our group of animals could have been consuming alcohol. So <clears throat> alcohol is basically a poison. We all know this. We've all had that awful feeling in the morning. Uh, but you have in your liver an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. Alcohol dehydrogenase is your friend and it's your best friend. And it, what it does is it allows you to metabolize alcohol without becoming sick. So it turns out that all primates have a form of alcohol dehydrogenase, but not all of them can metabolize alcohol very well. So lemurs, for example, have a, a version of this enzyme that is way less efficient than ours. They are not very good at drinking alcohol without being poisoned. Our version is 40 times more efficient than a lemur's. And scientists weren't sure when in our evolutionary history this enzyme became turbocharged and able to digest alcohol better. But they did a really fantastic study where they resurrected in the lab the proteins, the actual enzymes that our ancient monkey ancestors would have had using the DNA from fossils. And based on that, it looks like the common ancestor of humans, chimps, and gorillas had a new and turbocharged form of the alcohol digesting enzyme 10 million years ago that was 40 times more efficient than what other monkeys had. Why? Well, it was at that time that we came down from the trees and started to explore life on the ground. And so for the first time, primates were eating fruit that they had not only picked from trees, but that had fallen to the ground and that in many cases were slightly rotten or fermented. So being able to eat this without becoming sick would have been handy. It would have been advantageous. It meant that we didn't get ill. So also, this meant that if we could eat fruit that other animals couldn't, we would have had exclusive access to a food resource. And lastly, alcohol is one of the only drugs, in addition to marijuana, that can make you hungry. Most other drugs reduce your appetite. Alcohol actually makes you want to drink, uh, eat more, like the aperitif effect. So if you were a monkey and you found a pile of rotten fruit and it made you want to eat more of it, that would have been adaptive because you could eat all of it before somebody else got there. So this led scientist Robert Dudley to propose the drunken monkey hypothesis, which basically states that we would not have been able to come down from the trees and ultimately become human in the first place if we hadn't been able to digest alcohol. It is our oldest comfort, and in fact, it actually can be a friend, way, way more than a foe, way more than we might realize. So what is next in the scientific understanding of drugs and alcohol? Well, as Professor David Nutt, you might know him as the guy at Imperial who studies MDMA and so forth, uh, as he put it, drugs are an important part of our evolutionary history, and we cannot ignore them. So, as I said, in my research, I discovered that science has taught us that our base pursuits really are integral to what makes us human, and I think that they have actually contributed to some of our most amazing discoveries. Now, I spent three years on my book. I read more than 70 other books. I read 300 scientific papers. I interviewed about 50 scientists. My mother, after reading the first draft, summed up three years of work in one sentence. Most fun things in life are bad for you, but nothing will kill you faster than having no fun at all. Now, I just want to end this on a little personal note. Uh, you know, we are all more than familiar with the dangers of drugs. Uh, you know, I have had some raging alcoholics in my family. I have had a few friends die. You know, I've I'm more than familiar with these things. Uh, at the moment, I'm trying to get off of smoking to sleep. I have been addicted to smoking to get to sleep for a long time, and it's disgusting, and I hate that I do it. It stinks. It's bad for my health. I despise it. 
But with alcohol, you know, does it add something to my life? Yes. Uh, you know, we've all here had the hangover of death, and I think it's quite possible that my hangovers of death have been worse than yours, because in 2010, I had very bad liver damage from a drug that was erroneously given to me for epilepsy, and this destroyed me. I went from being the girl that could go on like a three-day bender, and then on the Monday still rock up and do my deadline on time. Seven months later, I was 40 pounds heavier, and I was sleeping 18 hours a day, and my liver was eviscerated. I couldn't have one drink without the next day feeling like I was made of concrete, and it was hell, and I worried I would never, ever be able to drink again. So I had to do a hardcore detox for several months. I didn't touch booze. I went to hot yoga every day. Good news, your liver is one of the few organs that can regenerate itself, so if you were ever worried that you've done some damage, you'd be shocked at how quickly your liver can repair itself if you give it a chance. So during those two months, I live in London. Living in London when you can't drink is a very interesting experience, and I recommend everybody do it as a tourist just once. It's fascinating. Here's a tip. If you're out with your friends and they're all getting hammered and you're not, consider it theater for one. <laughs> so I've had to think since then, you know, would I like to live my life with alcohol, without alcohol? If I look back at my life, would I want to remove it from my autobiography? Uh, you know what? No, actually like crazy weekends, Thursdays that turn into Tuesdays, incredible chats with my friends until five in the morning. There is no shadow of a doubt that my life is richer and more interesting for having had alcohol in it. That being said, we need to be aware of the dangers and we need to be really cognizant of how the industry handles these dangers. So you've all seen this, right? This has come out just this month, black packaging for tobacco, the same that they do in Australia. Right now, there's rumblings of doing the exact same thing in the alcohol industry. Do we want alcohol to be vilified and treated like a social pariah in the same way that tobacco is? Do we want booze companies to be treated the same way that people like Philip Morris are? No, and we should be aware of that. So there is a legitimate place for intoxication in society as far as I'm concerned, and we need to make sure that we treat it responsibly. Thank you. Um, thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Claire. I look forward to saying thank you to Ian when he is done. Uh, I want to reflect a little bit on the anthropology and the role of alcohol in our lives. The coolest science teacher I ever met was also the person who taught me a dark truth. I met him at the beginning of my ninth grade year, and his sublime coolness was impossible to deny. He was very young. He drove a light green Volkswagen Beetle, and he taught us sex ed in an era in which there was no sex ed. But still, there was that dark truth. He mentioned it to us one day when he was talking about the body's five senses, sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. And he said it almost in passing. What he said was, any sense experienced in excess results in pain. He lost me for the rest of the class because I was searching for a loophole to this rule, but there was none. The blinding light, a deafening sound, a scalding smell, a bitter, burning, acid taste, and as for touch, well, touch is nothing but the eternal dance between pleasure and pain. The exact same thing is true of one of our most sublime but perilous pleasures, the pleasure of intoxication. It is an unalloyed truth that getting buzzed is fun. It's an unalloyed truth that from prehistory on, human beings have always liked to have fun and have deserved to have fun, what with the lions trying to eat us and famine threatening to kill us and the realization that no matter what, we're all going to die someday anyway. And it's one more unalloyed truth that it's entirely possible to have fun safely with at least some intoxicants, especially alcohol. So thank you, alcohol, and thank you, brain chemistry, and thank you, early humans who figured out that the two could be connected in a way that would one day give rise to an industry. But intoxication is hardly without its risks. The biggest, of course, is addiction. There are almost as many species, species of addiction as there are things to get hooked on. The worst kind involves the substances you, lead, you need the least and get, yet get hold of you the hardest. Consider cigarettes. It's no secret that tobacco is exceedingly addictive, 
and that's partly due to the nimbleness of nicotine and partly to the particularly effective drug delivery system that a cigarette is. Cigarette smoke enters the body principally, almost exclusively, through the lungs and is then dumped straight into the bloodstream. Within eight seconds, the heart has pumped the essence of the cigarette straight to the brain where, as Zoe explained earlier, the nicotine molecule fits principally into receptors for acetylcholine. Secondarily, it also fits into keyholes for serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. That happy storm of brain chemistry creates a sense of arousal, alertness, well-being, and even improved cognition. Is it any wonder, then, that you wind up to wanting to experience that again and again and again until it's not a question of wanting it but needing it? And consider also that we're talking about an entirely legal substance, the deadliest and most addictive one, illegal ones that are taken, into the, are taken into the body in similarly efficient ways, snorting, smoking, injecting, and then explode in the brain even more powerfully, releasing a, releasing a deluge of good feel-good feel neurotransmitters that nicotine can't remotely match. In the new novel, Krista Dora by Tim Murphy, which follows a group of New York characters through 25 turbulent years from 1990 to 2015, the author describes the first time a college student named Matteo smokes heroin. And this is what he says. As soon as Matteo sees blue smoke curl up off the foil, he sucks it up into the roll, and then his world melts and crumples beautifully and softly inside his stomach, the velvety crumple blooming through every vein in his body. He sinks leagues down, and the world comes into focus from below, almost like looking up at the sun from underwater, everything quavering, tremulous, so kind and lovely. This is the perfect place, his body tells him. The heroin baggie is the hole in the air we crawl into to get there. The passage was so good, so vivid and visceral, it actually made me uncomfortable, as if it would make heroin look too good to at least some people in what will be a, a likely be a very large and deserved readership for this book. The addictive hold and feel-good power of drugs like heroin and crystal meth and cocaine is the reason that substance abuse counselors warn that there is no such thing as a safe way even to sample them. Let them in just once, and they're likely never to let you out again. Behavioral addictions, like gambling, eating, sex, and shopping, are very different things. You could go through your entire life without betting so much as a dollar or a euro or a pound on a hand of poker or blackjack, but it's pretty hard to go through life without eating, buying stuff, and wanting to make babies. Even without the chemicals that make drugs so addictive, however, behavioral addictions do a pretty nifty job of messing with your brain. In these cases, it's dopamine, the key neurotransmitter in the brain's feel-good pleasure centers. Food, gambling, sex, shopping, rev the accelerator on the dopamine system. That feels great for a while, but such regular overdosing on so potent a brain chemical eventually desensitizes us to its effects. As with all addictions, then, we need more and more of the behavior of choice to achieve the same results. Studies in Amsterdam, Germany, and the United States have shown that both drug addicts and compulsive gamblers exhibit steadily less electrical activity in the brain's reward centers as their addiction progresses, they also exhibit a similar fall off in the prefrontal cortex, the executive functions, where judgment and awareness of consequences reside. The result is at the precise time your body is crying out for more and more of what makes you feel good, you have less and less ability to appreciate why that's bad. That gives rise to the five-day binge. So where does this leave alcohol? It's true that there are some people for whom no level of alcohol consumption is safe. It's true, too, that alcohol is one more chemical you could go your entire life without consuming. 
And it's equally true that over time, if you do consume alcohol, the more you drink, the more you need to achieve the same pleasantly intoxicated state. But there's much more to it than that. Thomas Hobbes wasn't kidding when he observed in the 17th century that life in the state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, and that it has lived in a state of, quote, continual fear and, quote, danger of violent death. That's perfectly fine with nature itself. Your job, frankly, as far as your genes are concerned, is to survive to sexual maturity, stay alive long enough to reproduce, raise your children to self-sufficiency, and then die shortly after, thank you very much, so you quit gobbling up resources that other humans need. As psychopharmacologist Ron Siegel, author of the same book we mentioned earlier, Intoxication, the Universal Drive for Mind-Altering Substances, has observed, the fight, or fl the fight to survive as long as possible means that our brains are wired with a bias towards recognizing not the good, but to ruminating about danger. The realization that a tiger may jump out from behind a rock means that you never step out of your cage, cave again without looking worriedly at every rock you pass. The knowledge that if you don't forage or hunt, you will starve means that you're anxious every day until you've bagged enough food to get you through till morning. All of this has its modern analogs in the way we lie awake at night worrying about disease or job loss or getting all the bills paid. Such chronic anxiety is not a happy way to spend your life, but it does help you ensure that you get to keep your life for at least a while. There's pleasure in this, a little bit. Those reward centers in the brain are aptly named. When you've eaten or mated or stayed out of the way of predators, you get a little reward in a jolt of positively reinforcing chemistry that makes it likelier you'll, repeat, you'll want to repeat those good behaviors in the future. In the sense, we're like lab animals that get a little banana-flavored reward pellet when we pull the right lever or successfully run a maze. It's nice, but there's not a whole lot of dignity or autonomy in living that way. Then, however, we got smart. We figured out how to get our hands on the entire supply of reward pellets, and even better, to make new ones in all kinds of flavors and potencies and combinations. In other words, we discovered alcohol. It is alcohol's particular power that it fills in so many of the holes and eases so many of the pains that come with living in Hobbes' state of nature. As Dr. Siegel points out in his book, there are several types of low-level chronic stress that modern humans all experience every day, and all of them are entirely characteristic of our highly intelligent species. Our complex brains allow us both to contemplate past events and worry over coming ones. Our fight or flight response, that state of heightened alertness we experience in times of danger, when heart rate and respiration increase and adrenaline and the stress hormone cortisol flood our bloodstreams, well, that was meant originally for facing down deadly enemies in the wild. In the modern world, with those bills to pay and the kids to raise and the deadlines to meet, it gets stuck in the on position. Our communal nature means that we're extremely social creatures, but it also means we're extremely socially anxious creatures, spending most of our time in the presence of others and either judging them or worried that we're being judged by them. Now consider the perfect hand-in-glove way alcohol alleviates so much of that. It allows us to be in the moment without ruminating on the past or present. It relieves social anxiety. It powers down the fight or flight response. And most important, it helps us comfortably connect with the other people in our social circle. Alcohol does all of these things. And unlike other intoxicating chemicals, it does them in endlessly dose-regulatable ways available in all manner of dilutions and ABVs. Also, unlike any other intoxicant, alcohol is as much a menu item as it is a drug. Pot tastes terrible, so do cigarettes, 
and no amount of hiding that fact in a brownie or with a shot of menthol chemistry is going to change that. The rise of alcohol, on the other hand, gave birth to the art of mixology. Bartenders and developers practice a kitchen discipline, not a laboratory discipline, and their work is every bit the exercise in creativity that the chefs or the bakers or the cheese makers is. Yes, not all alcoholic beverages are the stuff of gourmands, and not all alcohol consumption is the stuff of the elegant dinner party or the happy mob bonding at the bar. There are cheap drinks, and sorry to say, there are cheap drunks. And when alcohol is consumed recklessly or in excess, every one of the benefits it confers is turned on its head. As Dr. Siegel points out, for the drunk, social drinking gives way to solitary drinking. Connecting warmly with others turns into connecting sloppily or brawling or not connecting at all. Taking a break from problems becomes avoiding problems. Temporarily alleviating unpleasant feelings turns into anesthetizing them away. There is, again, a reason that some people find they are happier and they are healthier if they don't drink at all. And there's a reason, too, that DrinkAware, the website we cited earlier, and other websites exist. No one pretends that alcohol is a risk-free substance and that it doesn't come with its particular perils, which is one reason almost every drinking culture on earth agrees that it is a pleasure that should be limited to adults, even and even then must be consumed with care. Still, it's undeniable that humanity would be much poorer without our discovery of alcohol and our mastery of its chemistry. Our most defining and indeed perhaps our sweetest trait is that we so profoundly need the company of one another. We gather together everywhere, in restaurants and in train stations, in churches and in synagogues, in vast stadiums where the greatest joy experienced by any one human in the crowd is the simple business of being in the presence of 90,000 other humans. And we gather, too, in bars, where we talk and we laugh and we cry and we dance. And when we're there, we consume the one substance that more than any other makes that simple fact of being together that much richer. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So we've heard the sort of good, the bad, the ugly, and the inevitable of drinking. Can't escape it, it would seem. So if it's everywhere, how do we ensure that we, as an industry, help to protect the people coming into our bars? What can we do to create a better drinking culture? And could we possibly, as a hospitality industry, work to save lives, potentially, versus uh, losing lives? One of the things that I've been really passionate about over the last few years is trying to add more meaning to the word, to, to the phrase, to your health. How could we add more meaning to this? Because I think today, more than ever, it's quite likely that you could be toasting your friends or colleagues with a green juice or a non-alcoholic beer or non-alcoholic cocktail as our attitudes to eating and drinking are rapidly changing. And this is driven in no small part by the ubiquitous millennial who seems to be disproportionately obsessed with health and well-being. But according to the media, the hospitality industry is probably not the first place that you might look for a positive role model. But we really witnessed a genuine shift in attitudes within our industry, which I think is potentially hope helping to reinforce the idea that hospitality can potentially save lives. Now, why does this matter? I think that, historically speaking, hospitality is rarely linked to health, and alcohol has been seen by the media as a panacea and a poison. And also, dining out today is perceived as a bit of a modern indulgence. 
But today, 21st century science is actually coming down on the happy side of the argument, which argues that if we eat well, if we drink well, if we move a lot, then you know, the new thinking goes that you might actually live a long and healthy life. I think today, more than ever, our industry has an opportunity to play a positive role in our consumers' health and well-being. And that really is to uh, try to provide more information, more and have more awareness and be better educated ourselves to enable us to serve the customer that wants to have their cocktail and drink it by increasing the options available to our consumer, by educating ourselves, by educating our staffs, staff, and by putting wellness firmly on the menu, we can protect not only ourselves, but also protect our industry as a form of self-regulation. Because health and wellness is not a fad. Sorry, guys, it's not <laughs> going anywhere. A recent Nielsen uh, research uh, a survey of over 30,000 consumers in 60 countries found that millennials will, 32% of millennials will pay a premium for healthier products compared to just 21% of baby boomers. And this trend continues with the younger generation, with 41% of those under 20 saying that they, willingly, they would willingly pay more. Also, studies show our love of keeping fit. Another Nielsen study found that the millennial consumer are now doing more gym-type activities than any other generation. And isn't our job as being part of the hospitality industry to give that consumer what they want, even if it might be an aquafaba sour? Anybody know what that is? <laughs> <laughs> okay, aquafaba is the juice that's in... Uh, chickpeas, and you can use it as a vegan egg white substitute. So perhaps it doesn't have to just be about chickpea juice as a way to embrace this new approach to health and wellness within hospitality. I think there are several other areas that we could look to embrace uh, as a way to, for us to take advantage of this shifting landscape. The first is actually to consider how socialising can save lives. Now, as Jeff mentioned, we have evolved as social primates. We obviously all know how it feels to be in harmony with one another and to feel connected, and we know how great that feels. We also know how painful it can feel if we're disconnected or left out. Now, according to a very recent study, only two years old, by the University of North Carolina, a healthy social life is just as important for longevity as exercising and diet. This is the first study of its kind to link social relationships with concrete measures of physical well-being, such as abdominal obesity, inflammation, and high blood pressure, all of which can lead to long-term health problems such as cancer, stroke, and heart disease. The study found that the more social ties that people have at an early age, the better their health is at the beginning and the end of their lives. Here's a quote from the study. Based on these findings, it should be as important to encourage adolescents and young adults to build broad social relationships and social skills for interacting with others as it is to eat healthy and to be physically active. And specifically, the team found that the sheer size uh, of a person's social network was important for health in early and late adulthood. In adolescence, social isolation increased the risk of inflammation by the same amount, uh, amount as physical inactivity, while social integration protected against ab abdominal obesity. In old age, social isolation was actually more harmful to health than diabetes on developing and controlling hypertension. So in conclusion, the analysis makes it clear that doctors, clinicians, and other health workers should redouble their efforts to help the public understand the important social, strong social bonds are throughout the course of all our lives. But what about us? We need to also be aware of the role, of the incredible role, in fact, that our industry helps to support these strong social bonds. After all, we are providing a safe, warm, hospitable, entertaining place for socialising, which is in turn helping to support the lives and longevity of our customers. We are saving lives, people. We are saving lives. Just by giving somebody a place to go to socialise, to make it entertaining and warm and welcoming, 
you are potentially saving lives. So the advice is clear. Let's spend all of our time socializing, right? <laughs> Sounds good to me. But, of course, the dose maketh the poison. And like all messages on moderation, the message is really about balance. A little of almost everything is good for you. But finding a middle ground is uh, in our approach to healthy eating and nutrition and drinking and exercise is unsurprisingly what is best for us. We need to work to give the consumer what they want, which is to be well and have a good time. And in fact, most of the research shows that if you have to be happy and you, to be well, you have to be happy and social, which is thought to be where some of the unexplained benefits of alcohol comes in. So my advice really is to encourage us all to think about how we can drink like we give a damn. If we're going to benefit from the effects of alcohol, we need to be mindful about what we drink, as much as we care about what we eat or how much we exercise. Starting with how much sugar we consume. Those of you that know me will know that this is my second passion after Belvedere vodka and other spirits. But I just want to spend a couple of minutes thinking about while socializing might be really good for us, and we know that the consumption of alcohol is in inevitable, let's also think about how we can protect our consumer with the amount of sugar that we're using in our cocktails. Because we know that actually Mary Poppins was a drug dealer. And uh, she was into some pretty hardcore stuff. None of the run of the mill, class A, boring stuff. She was into something much, much harder. And that spoonful of sugar ditty is not a cheerful song about housework. It's actually a subliminal advertising for one of the most highly addictive substances in the world. And if you believe the media, poor Jane and Michael actually didn't stand a chance. They probably died early <laughs> from a variety of diseases, cancer, diabetes, and the worst public affliction of all, obesity. Poor Jane and Michael. Just one minute silence for Jane and Michael, please. Now, the reason for that is because sugar, or sucrose, is a fast-track energy source. It releases dopamine in the brain, and it reinforces our reward pathways. That, and scientists compare this impact in the same way uh, to other drugs that create dependency, such as alcohol, nicotine, and cocaine. We know that a diet rich in Mars bars, donuts, and milkshakes is not going to lead to a long and healthy life. We know that. And we need to be aware, of course, of how much sugar that we consume in our diet, and also be very mindful that sugar is added to um, things such as bread, uh, pasta sauce, and hidden in, in everyday items such as cereal, etc. Not talking necessarily about the sugar that we eat, but I would like to talk a little bit about the sugar that we use in cocktails, because essentially, sugar in a cocktail is part of our cocktail DNA. It's even written in the definition, and we all know that that's a very important part of our, of our industry. So I think it would be unrealistic for me to say that our industry can continue after today by not putting sugar in cocktails. I think that's not really a realistic claim. Um, but do we really need to use as much, particularly when you consider that when we were creating some classic cocktail recipes 100, 150 years ago, oh, thank you so much. This has no sugar in it, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, that's the quality of those spirits probably wasn't anywhere near the quality that it is today. And we know that we need to limit the amount of alcohol we consume or face the consequences. But do we really need to, do we need, really need to use as much sugar as we do today? particularly when it comes to mixers. And just here is a sort of top 10 high sugar content mixers that you might use in your bar or in your restaurant. Now, I don't think anyone's surprised to see old Jamaica ginger beer up there. It's very delicious, great in a Moscow mule. Um, but also, you wouldn't be surprised to see Red Bull or Coca-Cola up there as well. But you might be surprised to see Fever Tree tonic water as being up there as part of the maximum sugar tax that will, will be applied. So I think we need to be more mindful of what we're adding, but also perhaps we need to take responsibility for helping the consumer understand how much sugar is being added or being used in their cocktails. Because the consumer is coming into the bar actually wanting a little bit more information, because this stuff is actually very confusing. So what is sugar? A little quick 
inf bit of information about what it is. So sugar, table sugar, is what we use to make uh, liquid sugar or simple syrup. It is a combination of two monosaccharides, fructose and glucose. And glucose we need. Glucose fuels our body. Every single cell in our body has use for it. And in fact, if we didn't consume glucose, our body would produce it. Fructose, however, so the 50%, the other 50% of sugar, is not needed in the body. We have no use for it whatsoever. And in, from an evolutionary perspective, we've really not consumed fructose apart from when fruit was ripe. And when fruit was ripe, it was always coupled with its uh, dietary partner, fiber, which helped eliminate the fructose from our bodies. So you're thinking probably, well, what does it matter? I mean, fructose is delicious. It's sweet, it's yummy, and if the body doesn't see it, then what's the problem? Well, it's really the Voldemort on the dietary hit list. It's the sweet molecule in sugar that makes sugar addictive. And if you just look here, so one glass of orange juice is the equivalent of six small oranges, both containing the same amount of calories. I would challenge you to consume as quickly the six small oranges that you could consume the glass of orange juice. Very easy for us to overconsume liquid sugar. And orange juice is fructose concentrated. And you can just see on the, on the graph on the right how this is converted in the body. So if you were to consume those six oranges, only one calorie would be converted into fat. But if you were to consume those, that glass of orange juice, 40 calories would be converted to fat. That is because your body has no use for fructose, so it metabolizes it directly through the liver and turns it directly into fat. What else do we metabolize through the liver? Alcohol. So when you're consuming fructose and alcohol, you're double stressing the liver, which is, of course, leading to a whole host of diseases, which is neatly summarized by Homer here. So just 12 non-scary ways that fructose can really help to destroy your body, ranging from tooth decay all the way through to erectile dysfunction. And this is really because all of the fructose you're consuming is, is metabolized by the liver. And when the liver is overloaded, it can lead to a whole host of metabolic issues within the body. So, Perhaps you're thinking, well, where is this sort of evil fructose molecule lurking? Well, it's actually lurking in the glass of orange juice that you had this morning, but also it's lurking in some of the ingredients that we use behind the bar. Obviously, simple syrup is 50% fructose. What I would recommend is that we just perhaps are more mindful about the use of simple syrup. Are we really needing to use so much of it? But what I would caution against using is agave. Now, agave is often marketed as a diet food, and very often I see cocktail menus all over the world where they're advertising their healthy cocktails, and they're healthy because they've used agave rather than sugar to sweeten the drink. Agave is 90% fructose, so all of that is being metabolized by the alcohol, so really placing a hell of a, a, hell of a lot of stress on, on the body. There are ways that you can help mitigate the use of these sorts of ingredients. So if you're taking out sugar, you can add mouthfeel by uh, fat washing, you can add uh, fats to the cocktail, you can blend your fruit rather than using juice. So I would just caution against using agave, but also be more mindful about the areas in which you use fructose. Now, of course, why does this matter? This, for me, actually relates to a much larger issue that we have with food and drinks within the business. I think today we don't realize how easy it is for our, our bodies to be manipulated and over, um, overwhelmed by synthetic uh, ingredients or even the addition of excess sugar. The genes that write up our flavor sensing equipment the nose and the mouth, actually take up more DNA than any other bodily system, more than the brain, more than the sex organs, more than your eyes. And from an evolutionary point of view, flavor is clearly very, very important because when we experience flavor in the food that we eat, it engages more parts of our brain than any other behavior. And this explains why it's so easy for the brain to be manipulated by the foods that we consume, which is why it's even more critical to be mindful of what we're eating and drinking because because today, more than ever, it's incredibly easy for our sophisticated sensory equipment to be overridden. How does that happen? Quick story about this seemingly innocuous machine, not the Dorito. <laughs> this machine, 
Does anybody know what this is? Anybody seen this in a lab? It's a GC, it's a gas chromatograph. Hannah's like, no, I've never seen this. It's a gas chromatograph. Essentially isolates flavor molecules and it gives the flavor industry the ability to concentrate them. Now, this machine was really put to great use from the 1950s and has really led to some interesting food technology and food developments. When the Dorito was introduced in 19, 1963, it actually debuted as a plain corn chip and wasn't particularly popular. But then the Doritos company went back to the lab and decided to isolate the flavor of taco using the gas chromatograph. They isolated the flavor of taco, turned that into a really attractive orange dust, applied it to the plain corn chip. Hey presto, we can't get enough of Doritos. We all know how addictive that orange powder is. And that's because it has uh, overstimulated the reward pathways that are, that are linked to flavor receptors. So, essentially, flavor technology has dramatically improved, improved over the last few years. And we have to ask the question, why? Why do we need flavor technology today? The reason for that is that food is actually becoming more dilute through over-farming, over-processing. So today, chicken doesn't really taste like chicken, tomatoes don't really taste like tomatoes, fruit doesn't really taste as delicious and nutritious and juicy as it used to. Food essentially needs help. But that's okay because there's now flavor technology. So if your food is being diluted, then there is a flavor solution for that. Here is one page of a book that is 2,000 pages long, which essentially is a shopping list of synthetic flavor compounds that you can now find added to your food. In, 19, in 1918, a study was conducted to see how much flavor that we're actually adding to foods ourselves, and it was half a pound of flavor. Today, we add 3.5 pounds of flavor to our food every year. That's every person, every man, woman, and child is consuming 3.5 pounds of added flavor to their food because food has, needs help. And while we're adding this flavor, the food industry is also uh, supporting our food with the addition of flavor substitutes and, additional, uh, and artificial flavors. So much so that they've actually created a very confusing categorization of natural flavors. So you might look at your packet of Doritos and it says that it's got natural flavors in it, but it could contain one of a number of different types of natural flavors. And I would say, actually, the only ones that you can really rely on is the one at the end where it says artificial flavors. You know if it, can, if it says artificial flavors on the label, it definitely contains artificial flavors. All of the other labeling is very vague and intended to mis mislead the consumer. So essentially, today we're really living in a world where lemonade is made from artificial flavors and furniture polish is made from real lemons. It's a very confusing environment for the consumer to live in. And for me, I think that we have a bit of a responsibility to help the consumer navigate this very confusing environment. So starting with going back to nature, going back to really understanding how to promote the use of natural ingredients with without leaning so heavily on sugars or synthetic ingredients. Because for me, there are three rules of flavor. The first is that humans are flavor-seeking animals. We are fun, flavor-seeking animals. And the food, the flavor that we experience when we enjoy food is so powerful that it's very, very difficult to, uh, to uh, resist. But in nature, there's a very intimate connection between flavor and nutrition. And uh, synthetic flavor technology has really worked to try to break this connection and confound us, so much so that when we're actually needing some vitamin C, rather than reach for an orange, we might actually instead reach for a can of Fanta. So I think it's really important that we as an industry understand the impact of synthetic flavor technology. We understand the impact of using uh, concentrated flavors. We understand the impact of using too much sugar. And we work to really try to protect our consumer through what we add into their cocktails, but also the information that we give them in our menus. Because essentially, this I love this quote, 
If we look deep into nature, we will understand everything better. And nature is fundamentally a very good place to start to help to protect our consumer moving forward. So that's it from me. That's my two pennies. Over to Ian. I can't sit still for that long, so I'm going to come up here. Um, so I guess my responsibility up here is a little bit twofold. It's to talk and really elaborate or, I guess, bring it back down to focus on what all of this means for us as bartenders and then what we can also do as bartenders with it all. Uh, I, I hate to ever assume that anybody would know who I am, so my name's Ian, um, and I've always been involved in hospitality. Uh, I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, Australia. Sorry about the accent. Um, <laughs> and my mum used to call it God's own country because she said he was the only prick dumb enough to live there. Um, <laughs> one of seven kids, uh, as young as I can remember, I was in kitchens. Uh, my first ever job was a quality control officer, which meant I got to sit near the pass as my mum catered for events and eat one of every dish to make sure it was just A-OK. -okay. <laughs> Big farm boy as it was. Um, it's really, it's gone so far back as my grandfather actually hired my father, and that's how he eventually met my mother. So you could go so far as to say I'm a third generation bartender. But I'm up here today because over the last, I've done this industry now as a professional for 10 years, but I get over the last five years, I've been fortunate to work with some fantastic individuals in some brilliant bars. Uh, I got to run the Mighty Bramble up here in Edinburgh, and by virtue of that, met a guy called uh, Ryan Chetty that hopefully you guys have heard of by now, because that's my job. Um, and we've gone on to create a White Lion and Dandelion, and then most recently, with my partner, I've kicked off doing a little thing called Trash Tiki, um, where you put it more eloquently as drink like you give a damn, but we want you to drink like you give a fuck, in all honesty. <laughs> um, and it's on tomorrow night at the last word. Sorry, couldn't help myself. Um, so, we serve a drug to consenting adults. As bartenders, we have to acknowledge that. It, it would be impossible for you to refute what we've heard today and turn around and go, no, we don't. We do. And that legal drug is awesome when it's enjoyed responsibly. And as we've seen today, it can be a real shining light on the radness of everything that it is. But it's also a drug that we don't respect enough. Uh, when we did this presentation in New Orleans last year, I uh, 11th hour derailed the talk and took it in a bit of a different 11th direction. 11th hour, 3 a.m. 3 a.m. <laughs> I, I, I decided it wasn't okay to just stand up here and talk about what Dandelion does. As a bartender and as somebody that's had their own issues in the past with drugs and alcohol, it was important for me to stand up here and not only acknowledge that, but acknowledge this social responsibility that we have. You always hear the f mood drop a little bit in the room as you come to that point, but that's just it. We're constantly aspiring to be professionals. We constantly don't want to be ashamed when we tell mum and dad we're not going to university, we're going to be a bartender. But when it comes to being a professional, that involves more than simply turning around and working 60 hours a week and reading three books and thinking because you put on a tie to go to work, you're suddenly an academic. There is a lot more to it all, and. Now, as I've reached this point in my career, it's actually one of my biggest passions, is to drive this industry towards professionalism with it all. To drive this industry to be accepting of what we're doing, and to drive this industry to really turn around and go, we're professionals in every single manner. We have infrastructure, we have ratification, we have the ability to look somebody else in the eye and go, I'm a bartender, and that is a true vocation that you can aspire towards being. Because I'm guessing none of us when we were going through high school, got told by our careers counselor at 15 years old, it's okay to be a bartender, right? It just didn't happen. And more than that, I really want to take this moment to turn around and say, whenever you work with alcohol, and it's a really important part of our job, is that if you have that colleague or if you yourself, you see them struggling with life and they need the drink to make it through the day, Maybe they need the two shots to steady their hands before they start their shift. Maybe it's something much darker at the end of shift and they're finishing every night going home, not remembering how they got home. For the love of God, have a conversation with that person. I've been on both sides of those conversations and it's never easy. It's gut-wrenchingly difficult. But that lack of infrastructure we have in our industry means that it's on us to turn around and be responsible to each other. 
we have to create our own infrastructure, and so ultimately, we are each other's support network. We still want to get drink, or we still want to get drunk and have a good time. But it's about doing all of this and being mindful about what we want to achieve in this industry. We want to achieve something awesome. We want to achieve something that gets people, maybe it keeps them alive even. I'm not sure I'm sold on that one. But <laughs> Socializing. <laughs> Ultimately, as bartenders, we almost have a Hippocratic Oath. Um, doctors have a Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. So maybe as bartenders, our Hippocratic Oath is to first make drinks that are good for you. Because alcohol is good for you. I think mean, Klugs, by the way, it's the first time I've properly heard you speak, and goddamn, you're awesome. Uh, <laughs> Zoe, no disrespect to you, I've just heard you before. But literally <laughs> listening to every, those, these fantastic panelists chat through it all, alcohol is good for you. Mentally, physically, chemically, it really does offer something fantastic, which as humans we should enjoy. But as bartenders that are responsible for dispensing this, we've also got to consider what our responsibility is with all of this. So we want to eat well and drink better, right? So maybe we can get our guests high on a higher quality. The supply of alcohol is not exactly a challenge. If we consider alcohol as the drug that it is, um, drug, as a commercial, drug dealing as a commercial business is about supply and demand. There is no difficulty in obtaining a supply of alcohol. In 2017, as a bartender, very easy to do. And as we can attest to by the many, many people walking the streets of Edinburgh over these next few days, there's certainly a demand for that drug <laughs> as well with it all. So how do we as bartenders capture those people and bring them into our bars and do so in a manner that is better for them in every single way? Well, to paraphrase uh, one of my all-time favorite movies, Pulp Fiction, we sell the Mad Men. And if the Mad Men is as good as you say, they'll be back for a, a thousand more. And that's where we came to with Dandelion. That's where we really reached a point where we turned around and we were like, okay, we've actually always had, and this all came about through a conversation Claire and I had where the Lion Company thing for Ryan and myself had always been, we want people to drink better. And obviously that has a really lovely parallel running with the direction that Belvedere has championed over the last few years. And if we want people to drink better, how do we do that? How do we create that social engagement where we bring people in? Um, Dandelion, to rattle off a few facts and figures for you, um, is a team of 24 people now. Uh, we are a hotel bar, but we aspire to be a hotel bar like none other, because all due respect, I think most of them in London are fucking boring. So <laughs> we play 70s guitar music. We do not force our staff to wear anything other than a simple t-shirt and apron. They're encouraged to be who they are. They're encouraged to let their personality show through in every single capacity with it all. Um, they're designed to be fun. They're designed to have, if people want to get up and dance, let them dance with it all and still put an unparalleled drink in their hand at every turn as they go along the way too. But when it came to the drinks in Dandelion, we knew we had to do something different. Uh, we knew we had to stand again on a direction that we believed in and push it forward with all our regard. And it came down to actually putting a lot more time and effort into our cocktails than we'd ever even done before with White Lion. Uh, we serve 400 to uh, our, our record now is over 800 cocktails in any one single night at Dandelion. Net sales are like 2.7 million. This bar is high volume in every single capacity, and we run it like a kitchen, and we're damn proud of how we run it. We also invest over 80 hours of mise en place per week into our cocktails. We actually hire a guy who his job is prep chef, and then we all pitch in along the way to help pick up as well. Um, and we did all that because we stood, stepped back and turned around and went, why are we just constantly picking up bottles off the shelves and going, okay, I know that brand and I know what that tastes like, so let's just use that. As opposed to turning around and putting the effort into making something ourselves, which ultimately we believed we could make better along the way with it all. It's 2017 and anybody can put alcohol in a glass and call it a cocktail. So what do we then step back and do and how do we drive forward with it all? And it actually comes back to something so simple. It's mise en place. Some of our drinks are 
very complicated, and some of them ultimately are wildly, wildly classic and simple in the way they go. But the development of the menu and the development of the staff comes back into one crucial ingredient, one crucial rule, and it's kind of obvious, but you put good things in, you get good things out. If you are happy to turn around and just pick up the bottles supplied to you in a normal bar every day and create a cocktail, great. That's fantastic. But for Dandelion, we want to strike a notion where we could step out and do something even more complex and involved with it all. It is that taking Michelin-starred kitchen approach and putting it into a cocktail bar. Because I've had the fortune to work with a number of great chefs over the years and quite recently finished up uh, a project with a really prolific chef. And he made a statement that when he made it, I, it dawned on me why we do what we do. We are like the bartenders that have gathered at Tails are such a tiny percentile of all the bartenders around the world. And you, you can at times be wondered, well, shit, am I really reaching the right people? Uh, like, obviously, we want to get our message out there to as many people as possible. But it, it was Dan Barber, and he turned around and he, he said that what the Michelin starred kitchens of today are doing, uh, they, they trickle down. He called it his trickle-down effect. He's like, this tiny 2% of kitchens around the world start doing something really weird and wonderful, and then the best elements of it, they permeate into the different tiers of kitchens until you wind up where uh, techniques and, and kind of approaches become ubiquitous with everyday cooking and eating. It, you take something like El Bulli, the world-famous restaurant, and everything it pioneered and created over the years, and now so much of what it does, you can literally walk into your French brasserie around the corner and see the same thing happening there. That's the responsibility we have as we work in these higher end, fuck, I hate that term, <laughs> cocktail bars. Uh, that is that responsibility we have as these bartenders that other people are looking up towards, is to turn around and actually create something that will make a difference for the next generation of bartenders. Lay that groundwork and that platform with it all as we go. And that's really where I wanted to conclude with. I actually took the, a shorter stint with this all because really I just wanted to stand up here to draw this all back together and drive this home to firstly as bartenders, if we put on this notion of professionalism, acknowledge everything you've heard about today, but because God we're good at doing this as bartenders, don't acknowledge what you've heard today and then not talk about it because it's apparently not as interesting as cocktail specs. Take what you've heard here today and talk to our other fellow professionals about all of this. Talk to the other bartenders that you work with about the dangers and the importance and the enjoyment that alcohol as one of the most prolific chemical stimulating drugs provides us. Talk to our other coworkers and colleagues about the responsibility we have with that and ultimately start building this professional network because no one's going to do it for us. And if we want to be professional, we are going to have to do it ourselves because LinkedIn sucks and everybody's on <laughs> Facebook anyway, right? Um, and then, if we're going to be these bartenders that pioneer and push people forward, if we're going to be these bartenders that make drinks that save lives, then turn around and stop just do taking the easy route. Get people high on a higher quality. Put in the time. It's not all rotovaps. We don't even own a rotovap. They're a waste of fucking money. It's really simple things that you can do. <laughs> Buy your own dried botanicals and make your own vermouths. We've managed to... Yes, there's the drinks. Um, Buy your own botanicals and make your own dried vermouths. Um, I... The drinks that you got here today come out in a different order to what they're up on screen, so I'm going to go through it all. Uh, you obviously got a beer, first of all. In case you haven't told, I'm not sure I have shameless promotion. It's Lion Lager. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a little one that we actually brew up here in uh, Scotland with the Old Worthy Brewery, and we actually use fresh passion fruit in there because lagers take too long to make and we're cheap. So we made an ale, but then we use fresh passion fruit just to dry it out a little bit with it all. Oh, no, go back. Um, so that was it. You got a beer, first of all. Wonderful, easy drinking, couldn't, like, the most rock and roll thing, as Zoe stand up and talked about, was to have a beer. We all love one. We seem to not want to order cocktails when we're actually, that's what we do for a living. Um, but it has that sugar in there in a very unique manner, where it's been fermented and turned into alcohol. Probably the best way to be consuming sugar with it all. The next one that we moved into was uh, a great Groot Martini. So it, it turns out that um, beer 
used to actually get you really high, not just kind of high. We all know that hops is a cousin of marijuana, but the reason it came around was because for a long time, beer used the likes of yarrow root that was actually a psychedelic when fermented in there. Mm -hmm. And then one day someone turned around and went, hmm, that's maybe getting me a little too high. And that's when hops started making their way into beer. So I didn't ferment the ingredients in the vermouth, I just macerated them, so don't worry, you're not about to start tripping balls or anything <laughs> like that. But I uh, took a really lovely uh, light skin contact wine from Dandelion, an orange wine, and then just banged in those botanicals in a microwave, turned it back out, no sugar whatsoever. Belvedere unfiltered, and just that great wine incorporated in there. And then the last one, um, I saw all your heads literally almost knock back as you did it. Sugar bomb and a half, right? I had to kind of fuck with you a little bit on that one. I was like, oh, let's like set them up nicely with the fermented sugar one and then a nice dry clean martini and then bam, alcohol and sugar in quite a high portion with it all. Um, it's a very simplified version of a drink that we serve at Dandelion called the Flower of Five. It turns out that passion fruit as a flower takes its name because it has 37 different symbolic acknowledgements similar to the crucifixion of Jesus and the actual Old Testament. And that's where it finds its name and its base of it all. Or you could acknowledge it for what it is, and that's a passion fruit French martini. But let's go with the other one, first of all. Um, but really, again, wanted to kind of knock your heads back. 90 minutes is a long time to sit in one spot. So I really wanted to pick everybody up again, talk about those sugars, and then talk about really turning around and going, see how we can actually be creative, and we can be responsible with it all. And when we're not responsible about it all, we wind up with a drink like that. For a lot of people, that's probably going to turn around and be like, hmm, that was really sweet that guy doesn't know how to balance a drink. So I'll disclaimer and say, I did do that on purpose. But uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well. There's a few empty glasses. You're going to be buzzing for a while. That's good to see. <laughs> um, but in conclusion, that was why I was up here. I really wanted to bring this all home and really push everybody as you leave here today. It's difficult to try and do a talk where there's two different key points with it all. But it is. Let's be professional and acknowledge alcohol as the drug that it is. And then in turn, do good with it. Maybe there is that Hippocratic oath out there that we can potentially one day first make a drink that is good for you. Cheers. Well done. That was great. Very nice. Right. Thank you. So I uh, remember this slide from, oh, 90 minutes ago. Uh, we wanted to tell you something, tell you what we've told you, and then tell you it again. So just a quick sentence. In summary, Zoe, recommendation for you moving forward. So if, if to drink is to be human. To drink is to be human. Uh, it's about making sure that you can still enjoy a drink when you're in your 80s rather than destroying your liver and having to abstain for the rest of your life. Like if you love it, and I had a good conversation with a friend of mine, what's your favorite drug? He said, actually, alcohol. It really is. So just don't ruin your capacity to have it when you're 60. Yep. Clugs, how should we drink better? Echo in a slightly different way. You are wired to get drunk, or at least to drink. We all deserve to drink. We are human. We face a whole lot of work to survive every day. So drinking is one of the great rewards. We get to medicate that, but also to embrace the fact that we're alive in the first place. Just manage it in moderation, and it's a joy and a right that we can all experience for life. For me, drink responsibly means sweetening responsibly as well, and uh, just to be more mindful about what we're consuming and what we're asking our guests to consume too. Ian? Professionalism requires more than just long hours and reading a few books. It's an acceptance of responsibility and purposeful action that will cement hospitality as a true vocation. Oh, very good. Very nice. Should have written that down. Really, if you Google hospitality right now, it's defined as the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers, according to Google. And according to Google, Scotland is renowned for its hospitality. <laughs> so... <laughs> so, Scotland, let's embrace this new landscape and fly the flag for a new, improved definition of hospitality. One that not only provides a friendly, generous reception of uh, visitors and strangers, but one that is proactive in helping to prolong their lives, as well as that of our staff and our customers and, of course, our own. So that when we say to your health, we actually really mean it. Thanks, everybody.